Welcome back to the Star Trek Critic. It has finally happened. This is the last installment of the original series, Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Yes! If you're new to the Star Trek Critic, each episode is treated as a school project, starting with 100 points and subtracting one point for each error, while I leave annoying commentary like that person behind you in the movie theater that just won't shut up. Also, a large portion of the video is still photos to prevent copyright claims. And you won't see much of me in the video at all because this is me in front of the camera. No! But it's true, I seriously get tongue-tied in front of a camera. Just a reminder, Gene Roddenberry died right after this movie was completed. The first point is lost for this beautiful explosion going on a two-dimensional plane. If a moon actually exploded, the blast would have gone in all directions. Have you ever wondered, this is a Starfleet ship, how much of our tax money pays for a monogrammed teacup? Look closely, these seats are adjusted the old-fashioned way. Captain Sulu has finally made Captain of Excelsior. Yes! But why did they give him a three-year mission to categorize space farts? To rehearse for this scene, everyone was told, just act like you're in California during an earthquake. Look closely, this cup says Excelsior, and this cup is blank, so minus one point for using a different cup. So according to his captain's log, they're finishing up in the beta quadrant. The helmsman gets to say the first I. They are well over 50 light years away from this blast, so minus one point. They are not that close to get hit. And minus one more point for a ship that big, stuffing all their crewmen in nine to a room. What's up with that? This is where you learn they got the idea for this movie from the Chernobyl disaster and the breakup of the Soviet Union. Grace Lee Whitney as Commander Rand gives I number two. Here Sulu's hair is pretty well combed, and here it's a mess, so minus one point. Zulu offers assistance to the Klingon Empire. Brigida Curla says, nothing happened here. Zulu says, let's have it. That's what he said. That's what he says. You really can't tell in the video, but it is moving very slowly. My guess is Praxis is not orbiting a Klingon planet because if the blast was that big, it would have killed billions. Here is a shot of the beautiful Klingon flag. San Francisco is the most expensive city in the country. Do you really think they'd have a government base there? And seriously, how do they not know what's going on? A Klingon moon just exploded. Check off Needles Kirk by saying, hey, you're not top brass anymore, are you? Kirk's like, Bones, did you hear what he just said? Minus one point for not knowing that Sulu has been gone for three years. As they all stand up, how many perform the Picard Maneuver? Look closely and count how many tug their shirts, also known as the Picard Maneuver, when they sit down. And this meeting's not too high of a classification because it's in an unsecure area. The Klingon Empire is huge. Just how many planets did it affect for the whole empire to just have 50 years left. It had to be more than just one planet. Bok lets everyone know he wants the Enterprise crew to retire with a bang. But Kirk's like, no, I mentally retired already. And minus one point because that explosion would have destroyed the planet and not just ripped away the ozone. The explosion was two months ago. There's no mention whether the Federation offered more assistance or whether these Klingons still said stay out the entire time. This is Spock's way of saying his dad made him do it. And Spock is totally doing this as a resume for his next job as ambassador. We all know that. Why does he say dismantling space stations instead of a peace treaty? Minus one point here. She should know Starfleet is more than just battling Klingons. She plays too many video games. Admiral Cartwright really wants to clean house, doesn't he? Captain Kirk takes Admiral Cartwright's side, and Cartwright's here trying not to tell Kirk about his dirty little secret. And Spock says that's a conservative attitude. What kind of crap is that? Here's where Kirk would like to issue a few colorful metaphors. Double dumbass on you! Minus one point, Spock would have told Kirk in advance of what he had planned. This is an unusual statement like they expect someone to attack the Enterprise. And Kirk is right, there should have been an ambassador team on the Enterprise with them. So minus one point for not having an ambassador. In one breath, he says, Godspeed, ladies and gentlemen. A woke liberal's nightmare. This is Cartwright's way of saying, you'll never guess what I got planned for you. Kirk is currently wondering, don't Vulcans have proverbs about Vulcan characters? And Kirk says, you're just doing this to kiss up to your dad. Look closely, is that Valeris against the wall? However, this is Spock's outlook on the whole thing. Well, why have we got to lose? <laughs> 
How would you like to have those windows in your house? What Kirk is really saying is that he planned to sleep in for the next three months until his retirement date. The next point is lost for a space station with all the ships trapped on the inside. If the Earth gets attacked by aliens 300 years in the future, we are screwed. Minus one point for a single set of doors on the turbo lift. And why are there so many fire extinguishers in this movie? So the bad girl is the only one that ever says Captain on the Bridge. And while they welcome Lieutenant Valeris to the Enterprise, McCoy is secretly thinking, we've had a different girl and a different pilot for each movie. Is this how J.K. Rowling got her idea for a different dark arts teacher each year? And it is possible for Kirk not to know who his last minute crew members are going to be. This is Spock's way of saying, my seven years are almost up. Scotty says, I number three. This phrase could be taken in more ways than one. Kirk says, we're gonna peel out of here like we're drag racing. What are they gonna do? Sabotage the event having thrown into a Klingon prison camp? Captain, may I remind you that regulations specify thrusters only while in space time? McCoy's thinking, she's a Vulcan ass kisser, all right. Valeris gives I number four. Minus one point for reused footage of Enterprise A. And minus one point for going through those tiny doors at one quarter impulse speed, which according to Star Trek lore is supposedly one sixteenth the speed of light, which means they just blasted through there at 11,000 miles per second. Yeah! Minus one point for a Stardate mismatch. Three months have passed, which would not be one. Sadly, Merritt Buttrick left us two years before the movie. On a lighter note, Kirk's son David is starred in those salt and pepper shakers. And I'd love to have these paintings. So the purpose of the fire extinguishers is to differentiate between the original series and the magical world of the next generation Enterprise. Automated fire system. A force field contains the flame until the remaining oxygen has been consumed. Always look out for somebody who is a total ass kisser. Especially one that strangely had his luggage. Why is it only Vulcans have neat stuff in their quarters? Spock's Earth heroes are Adam and Eve and Nixon. Spock again hints that his seven years are almost up. Spock misquotes his favorite George Michael song. While Valeris fishes for dirt on Spock, he says he wants her to take his place on the Enterprise, but that position would be the science officer, not first officer, because she doesn't have enough rank yet. And now Valeris kisses up to Spock. Wait, are they drinking out of the same cup? Here is a beautiful view of the Klingon Chancellor's bird of prey. Kirk says he's never been this close to a Klingon ship. Even he is trying to forget the last movie, where they travel together through the Great Barrier. Commander Ahura says, I number five, and you know what that means. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Kirk finally meets Chancellor Gorkon, and the only thing that's going through his head is, you don't look at all like you did in the last movie. His comment sounds spur of the moment, but I'm pretty sure they already had the dinner planned. And why do both of them have their eyes closed? You really don't see Kirk this bitter, do you? Valeris sets him up for failure. No, Spock. Chekhov says this line. Nichelle Nichols refused because it was inappropriate to reference that movie this way. You can even see her eyeball him when he says it, like, oh hell no, you just didn't say that. Guess who's coming to dinner? Minus one point for Chekhov always having the cliche lines. But guess who else said it? Guess who's coming to dinner? Minus one point for using the next generation transporter room for a blockbuster movie. Legs for the legs. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. This is a sped up version of the dramatic shot. During that time, Scotty moves from here to here. So minus one point. Captain Spock finally meets his favorite character from Tron. But I think he's been drinking because that's not his military advisor. General Chang says, I've always wanted to meet you, Captain Kirk. And Kirk says, I love your singing and the sound of music. Burke and Samno, which one is which? They look alike to me. And they called her a ma'am that will offend woke liberals everywhere. Acknowledge my gender again and I will you in the ass. Look closely, they are on the Enterprise A, so why are they in the observation lounge of the Enterprise D? So, minus one point. Minus one point for serving Romulan ale to their blood enemies, the Klingons. That's really gonna piss them off at a diplomatic dinner. And the Enterprise crew on the left are wondering, why do Klingons love Shakespeare? And undiscovered is spelled different in the captioning. And now they're gonna spend the rest of the dinner toasting the living shit out of each other. Spock and Gorkin are getting along very well, while Kirk is thinking, who's flying the ship if everyone's in here? Why did they know that Romulan ale is illegal in the Federation? Scotty believes drinking with aliens is the future. Can anybody tell me who those paintings are of? 
That one looks like Sarek. Bog tells Kirk not to mince words. I would like to correct General Chang here because the phrase is, in space, no one can hear you scream. This general gets to be famous for stuffing blue spaghetti in his mouth. Chekhov gets to say another cliche line that pisses off the Chancellor's daughter. One thing you don't learn is how much damage that explosion actually did to the Klingon Empire. Then Chang says they need breathing room and Kirk decides to quote Hitler. And Chang says, hey, you saw me on that movie, I was the good guy. Awkward silence all the way around the table. And Chang's thinking, oh, this is going to be a long trip, it is all my idea. Dinner ends with both Chancellor Gorkun and Spock thinking, the next time we'll do this just by ourselves and leave the kids at home. And now the Chancellor quotes Aldous Huxley. Kirk's like, is he just going to quote Shakespeare through the whole movie? And of course the answer is, yes, he is. This is one of the few times you see Kirk tired. And this is one of those times where you really feel sorry for Spock, because Spock and Chancellor Gorkhan are trying really hard to make this thing work. Minus one point for drinking black coffee at night when you're trying to get to sleep. A doctor should know better. Aww. Look closely, there are glasses next to David's picture. Minus one point for a time mismatch. His comments implied one day passed, but it's really only 1 a.m. on the night after the dinner. 300 years in the future, they still read the Book of Etiquette. Minus one point for mentioning Romulan Ale on the captain's log. He should know better. Who came up with the light turning on with the intercom? That's just mean. Spock knows something is up. Minus one point for Chekhov on duty after drinking all night. Did Uhura drink too, or did she just have the night shift? I'm not really sure. Uhura says I number six. Minus one point here, the ship would not swivel to the left like it did in zero gravity. Gorkon is thinking, did we just strike an iceberg? The bridge wants to know if Scotty can read. Scotty is still fully loaded with alcohol. Since you don't see him till after they fire, there's no way of knowing if he went straight to work after the dinner. Look closely, all torpedoes are accounted for. Where were all of them standing before this? So minus one point, it's just for show. Look closely, Valeris hits the keyboard and now two torpedoes are missing. Uhura says I number seven. Chang is missing right now. I wonder why. Camera shadow on the left, minus one point. Look closely, Kirk's vest is inverted, so minus one point. This is how I'll look if I go into zero gravity too. The next point is lost since objects in zero gravity will not move like they do if you drink fizzy lifting drink. Minus one point for a visible string pulling the phaser. And a phaser will not leap out of a holster like that in zero gravity. Minus one point for a warrior race not knowing how to fight in zero gravity, which probably happens much more times than Star Trek actually shows. Wasn't it Ender's Game that had a zero gravity war game where they kicked themselves off the wall at each other? Minus one point for way too much blood coming out of these Klingons. Look closely, you can see the cable holding Gorkon up, so minus one point. Is it now sexist to refer to a ship as she, or is it actually that ship's preferred pronouns? This is also the only time Klingons have purple blood, so minus one point. Where has Chang been this whole time? Also, did he cut the gravity generator intentionally, or did the photon torpedoes knock it out? I think he cut the gravity himself. Wouldn't there be a computer record of a transport pad to transport pad transport? Or would it be harder to hide the data of off-pad transports? Luckily, the Klingon ship did not fire on the Enterprise with Kirk's surrender, which is a little unusual for Klingons. Look closely, the patch he puts on his shoulder is horizontal. Uhura says, I number eight. Minus one point for going without any security or medical aids. Brigadier Kurla is pretty level-headed. He didn't shoot them. And did you notice Kirk buttoned up his shirt before he beamed over? McCoy quotes Vulcan poetry. Minus one point for moving him. He could have broken bones that would cause internal bleeding. McCoy actually does know a little bit of Klingon anatomy, but he's probably in panic mode right now. And from here to here, he unbuttoned his shirt. Why did he do that? Actually, I don't think Chang said this at all. While McCoy tries to save Gorkon's life, let's take a good look at those Klingon chairs. Look at that beautiful stained glass thing right before Gorkon tells Kirk to keep the faith. Gorkon knows there's a conspiracy going on, but it's too late for him. Look closely. McCoy sits. Now he's standing. Minus one point. His hands are clean. Minus one more point. And Kirk is handcuffed twice. Minus one more point. Spock is very quick to take over. When you get to the next generation, you'll notice Riker stumbles around a little bit. Uhura says, I number nine. 
Valeris wants to fight. Fox says, This peace plan was my idea. The last thing I'm going to do is start shooting. And Chekhov asks, What happens if we fail? And Spock says, The worst thing possible. The diplomats get involved. No! Welcome back, John Shook as the Klingon Ambassador to Earth, who really has the Federation president by the balls right now. But the president is thinking, didn't I see you on MASH with Colonel West, who got all his lines cut for the theatrical version? And won't both of you be on Deep Space Nine later? While the ambassador's response is, well, you went 10 years as the most annoying dad in the country. Then you messed with Janeway for a year on Voyager. And I know that's just a painting of the Eiffel Tower in the background and we're really not in Paris. While Ambassador Nonclus is thinking, both of you should be wondering why I'm in here in the first place because I'm the Romulan ambassador and this really isn't my business, so minus one point. Then the ambassador asks, is that a microwave? I could really use a burrito right now. While Sarek says, no, oh, this was all my idea, but they always screw up something and say it's my fault. And I only get one line in this whole stinking movie, and you promised it was going to be filmed in Paris and not just a Paramount stage with a bad painting of the Eiffel Tower through the window. So I say, let them go to prison. Minus one point for even asking the Romulan his opinion, while Nonclus is thinking, I'm just going to sit here and take notes and see how much more damage I can cause without them realizing I'm behind the whole thing. He says he's not a president of Earth. Just a reminder, I am grading the original theatrical version, which does not include this scene of Colonel West describing a sneak recovery mission while the Romulan ambassador is still in the room. Minus one point for Enterprise not going with Kronos to the Klingon home planet as Earth representatives. And what's up with Valeris using an old Earth proverb to explain sabotage? Don't Vulcans have stories to tell? Or do they just think humans are too stupid to understand them? They can be logically pompous and racist at times. And why does she think she's the president? Shout out to Azit Boer for wanting to continue the peace talks. Look quick. This explains the rest of the movie covers a one week time frame. Minus one point. She says make no military rescue attempt. While there is a military rescue attempt chart in the background, she must be onto them. And she says there's no way I'm going to Earth now. That's not safe. And you're not on Earth either. That's the 10 forward set and a fake painting of the Eiffel Tower. President's like, rats, she's on to me. Brigadier Curla and Colonel West would get along pretty well. Is she wearing the necklace because she's Chancellor or because it belonged to her father? Chang's such an ass. It was his idea the whole time. Azit Burr wants a fair trial, but only as long as Kirk fries. Now the news on the trial by today's woke liberal media. This country was run by vegetarian women rather than flesh-eating men. This whole space disaster would never have happened. You know, right now we're working to raise the consciousness of the vegetarian minorities with diet sensitivity training so that people will be able to deal with the... All these Klingons shouting Kirk's name. William Shatner is such a humble man. This won't go to his head at all. It turns out Worf is his own grandpa. And now there is a statue of the Eiffel Tower in front of a painting of the Eiffel Tower. But don't let the big screen TV between the two microwaves fool you. That's just a redress set of 10 forward in California. Now the patch is vertical, minus one point. Kirk's thinking, wait a second, isn't my translator Captain Claw who chased me through the Great Barrier? The Klingons televised their show trials more than the Democrats did the January 6th committee. Minus one point here, the Klingons next to the judge are all mannequins. Colonel Worf is a defense attorney. Does he ever get a chance to question anyone himself, or is he just paid to lose? Also, the peace talks are still going, so they would have invited a Federation liaison to participate, so minus one point. While on the Enterprise, they're supposed to be watching Space on the Bridge, not the news. This should be aired in one of the many lounges, like 10 Ford, but that's the President's office right now, so minus one point. But what does the crew really think of the trial? They're screwed. They're dead. Did I leave the iron on? Spock should have known this already, so minus one point for not asking Kronos One for more information before it flew away. And minus one point for the clock being off by six hours. Dr. McCoy makes a Klingon laugh. <laughs> If you want to get technical, he wasn't on the Enterprise the entire time. This is the nail in the coffin, serving Romulan ale to the Klingons who hate Romulans. And guess whose idea that was? Chang removes his cape for dramatic effect. Why is Chang trying to say he tried to say Gorkon? Oh wait, this is the doctor's line. Dr. McCoy does a really good plea right here, but it doesn't get very far. You know you're in trouble when they use your full name. Chang quotes Shakespeare again. 
And she's thinking, how did he get that information from the Enterprise? And why did we just cut to Valeris? What's up with that? So Colonel Worf is not a woke liberal where everybody's political views are on trial. Now Chang quotes Adlai Stevenson. Kirk admits it's his job to take one for the team. Judge says, damn straight that's your job, you're going to pay. She's thinking, I got Kirk sent to prison and in charge of the peace talks. I'm a Klingon hero. Sulu's thinking, hey, it's my job to come to the rescue. Spock is thinking, shit, this is all my fault, isn't it? Rand is thinking, it's about time that little bastard went to jail. Sarg is thinking, they promised me a free trip to Paris just to say that one line. Admiral Cartwright is thinking, good riddance, I've been working my butt off in Starfleet for 30 years and he gets all the credit just for saving some whales. Colonel Worf says, ah, oh, come on, give him a break. The judge says, all right, we'll just send him to a frozen wasteland instead. Kirk's like, oh, you're going to regret that decision real soon. And they're both thinking, are there girls there? Minus one point for the clock because it was 11 a little while ago. Scotty's thinking, damn, I thought we were going to be done with that pompous ass. This is the evidence. The physical torpedo count does not match the online record, which changed while they were firing. Now either Spock is related to Sherlock Holmes, a fictitious character, or he is lying, so minus one point. Shout out to this extra who probably has military experience. Minus one point since they waited for the trial to end before they started their investigation. Valeris says, let's go to war right now. Scotty explains why this is a bad idea. In today's woke Hollywood, this scene would never happen. An older straight white male with much more rank and experience telling a young immigrant woman that she is wrong. If this was aired in a theater today, there would be protests and emotional meltdowns all over. Valera says, I number 10, and you know what that means. Hi, yi, 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 yi. The correct terminology is to pair, not to pairs. Meanwhile, on Rura Pente, did they walk all the way from the edge of the magnetic shield? Is this a metaphor to symbolize what Kirk and McCoy will not be getting for the next 30 years? <laughs> They're supposed to be freezing, but you don't see anybody's exhaled breath. Minus one point. Aren't electronic frontiers and magnetic shields the same? And if the universal translator's been confiscated, how do they know what this guy was talking about? It looks like Star Trek VI stole hell scenes from the devil and Max Devlin and the black hole. Amazing since Disney never could do science fiction. Look closely, this alien lizard has a hole at the bottom of his skull because it's a mask, minus one point. How much do you want to bet Martia staged this whole altercation? She paid the giant Muppet to harass Kirk just so she could come to the rescue and be his fake friend. Kirk gets to smoke in a Star Trek movie. I wonder what Gene Roddenberry thought about that. How long did it take Kirk to figure this one out? Martia has way too much information. That should be a red flag for Kirk. But his only question is, didn't your husband steal a baby? Oh my gosh, they are serving real turkeys on a starship. Are they trying to give the finger to vegans in the last Star Trek movie? Not at all. The purpose of the kitchen is because they are overlapping with the next generation. This shows that 75 years have passed. This crew is lucky. They cook real food. However, on the next generation ship... We no longer enslave animals for food purposes. Hmm? However, the differences are worse than you think. You've seen something as fresh and tasty as meat, but inorganically materialized out of patterns used by our transporters. In old Star Trek, they store and cook their own food. In new Star Trek, they eat their own poop. Valeris says, surely they have disposed of these boots by now. But Spock tells Valeris, now don't call me Shirley. Don't call me Tiny. And don't call me Honey. Minus one point for having unsecured phasers in the kitchen because somebody could just grab a phaser and start shooting at the food. And minus one point for that goop not oozing all over the place. Personally, I like the fire extinguisher in the kitchen. It's a reminder that not everything works by magic. This is Spock's way of saying Kirk is currently getting his ass whooped. Oh look, Kirk is getting his ass whooped. He's thinking, I get to beat up Kirk in the last fist fight of his Star Trek career. He's thinking, wow, this Kirk guy really does keep the troops entertained. Marty is thinking, he better not die, he's my ticket out of here. McCoy is thinking, ah, uh, to be a kid again. Kirk is thinking, at least this is a prison fight scene and not a prison shower scene. And every male in the audience feels his pain. Martia talks about the birds and the bees. This is Kirk's way of saying, how about tonight? Kirk confesses his fears. Martia makes her move. McCoy's like, am I going to have to put up with this crap for the next 50 years? Over on the Excelsior, Sulu is awakened by a creepy guy at the door and he's thinking, don't you work for Kathy Bates at Saber? 
And why are you opening my door? You're the communications officer. You could have called me since that's your job, so minus one point. Back on the Enterprise, Chekhov is doing some serious purple drugs, and he's thinking, wow, this transporter room doesn't look like the Enterprise D's at all. No one will notice all they did was add a control booth and an old-fashioned fire extinguisher and think nobody would notice. They also knew the transporter was used, so minus one point for waiting so long to scan the transporter pad. This is the look you get when you question Spock's logic. Minus one point for using an Enterprise D hallway. Their crew quarters in the future are terrible. Even Navy V ships from the 1940s had more space. The next point is lost for visible Velcro holding up these magnetic boots. Why not just use magnets? Crewman Dax is played by Michael Snyder, who also had a small part in Star Trek IV. Minus one point for poor Chekhov having just too many bad lines in this movie. And minus one point for only one pair of gravity boots on a ship that could always lose artificial gravity. Everyone should have a pair. Hey, that's what she said. This is when they discover there's something a little odd about Martia. And we don't know what Dr. McCoy is thinking right now. You're weird! <laughs> minus one point for this trolley only going 30 feet. They could have walked that. And 30 feet later, after going past some really cheesy special effects, they stop. Marcia transforms from a giant muppet to a young human girl. Kirk is now super worried, thinking, I just kissed her last night. This is really a bad plot twist. Kirk is slightly relieved that she turned back into a giant muppet. And both of them are thinking, it's a real good thing our stand-ins went to film this in the freezing Arctic and not us. Scotty says eyes number 11 and 12. One eye is sufficient acknowledgement. Minus one point for not already hiding deep inside Klingon space waiting for this moment. Minus one point for not telling McCoy about the patch until now. Minus one point for not having a Klingon translator on a diplomatic mission involving Klingons. Minus one point for having all these Klingon books. This scene would have worked just fine if the online translating program was faulty and they were reading it and got it mixed up. And you can see how pleased Nichelle Nichols is in doing this scene. And they're like, why didn't they just use the Universal Translator? And Klingon sensors are pretty weak if they can't figure out it's a Federation ship. Back on Rura Pente, Kirk gets to punch a woman. Kirk was on to her all along. Minus one point for turning into Kirk and not a big monster that could beat him up. While they fight, McCoy makes snow angels. Kirk is slightly full of himself in this scene, isn't he? The prison guard quotes Kevin Malone. Well, 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 well. Martia is usually shorter, so points up. Kirk says, not me, you idiot, him, and not her, so minus one point. Minus one point for this scene since it was used as a teaser in the commercial, so everybody watching it would think Kirk got killed. Guard wants to know who wanted him killed, so McCoy says, Well, since you're all going to die anyways, I'm going to tell you. Kirk has a Tron moment. Kirk quotes Commander Riker. <laughs> Kirk's like, it happened again. We're on the Enterprise D transporter pad. Scotty drinks his coffee while going through the formal dining room thinking, all they did was remove the Enterprise models from the wall and put on old art so everyone in the audience will think this isn't the Enterprise D set. And what kind of a moron would hide uniforms in an air vent? Here are the clues they redress the next gen hallway again, so minus one point. Minus one point for not doing an inventory inspection, which would have shown Burke and Samuel's suits were missing. And minus one point for Valer's not cleaning those suits so they would be present for an inventory inspection. And minus one point for leaving their bodies in a hallway for all to see, because it's obvious that there's somebody else on board doing everything behind the scenes. Today's lunch will be salad. Jack has made this really scrumptious dinner. He made salad. Minus one point for this scene, the Enterprise has the worst crew quarters available, and they don't explain. Are the quarters now co-ed, or did you just crash on the top bug after a party? And a girl living in your room is the last thing you want, because all you're going to do is get a whole bunch of guys coming over all the time trying to get laid. And I don't know about you, but I'd love to have one of those blankets. Look closely, no earring, earring, minus one point. Buck is really pissed at her too. Valeris quotes Alec Baldwin. Minus one point for having this interrogation on the bridge. Not everybody in there needs to know what she's going to say. Is she bluffing or is the Enterprise being tracked right now? We will never know. This is the first time we ever see a torture scene initiated by Spock, who is thinking, Come on, Valeris, I know you can scream louder. I heard you on Porky's. <laughs> this comment is here because in the deleted scenes, Sulu sneezed. Camp Kitamir is near the Romulan border, which explains why a Romulan ambassador would be there. Surely not. And don't call me Shirley. And don't call me honey. 
Don't call me tiny. This turned out to be a pretty good screenshot. Bob prefers it dark. What's he trying to tell us? I take it back. Like my men. Kirk's wondering, why does Spock get all the cool stuff in his quarter? While Spock is wondering, why did they give me such a crappy pillow? They both consider themselves extremists. I find that odd. Kirk and Spock have some male bonding time and both are thinking, how are we going to get out of this one this time? Kirk insults Spock one last time for almost getting them killed. Look closely, you can see a parade of flags marching into the building. The president gives a speech while Admiral Cartwright is thinking, when he gets taken out, I'm in charge. Chekhov gives I number 13. Minus one point for no starships orbiting a planet with a galactic conference going on. There should be dozens. And minus one point for Noah noticing the renegade Enterprise is approaching really fast. They're all thinking, it's always the engineering section that gets destroyed. Why can't we leave now? Chang sees Chekhov and calls him Kirk. Commander Ahura quotes Shakespeare. The famous Klingon general is perplexed by the Kirk maneuver which in short is to back up. McCoy's like, yay, this is fun, already drunk. While Scotty's saying, oh shoot, we're at red alert. Did you ever think that the Klingons have a conspiracy theory that maybe Chancellor Gorkhan intentionally blew up Praxis for his peace talks? And that was why they wanted him assassinated. This is a beautiful shot of the Enterprise while General Chang quotes Data. If you quit me, do I not leak? Spock is so nervous he farts. Commander Ahura saves the day, but minus one point since that equipment is on Excelsior. Oh look, it's Odo, posing as a human, posing as a Klingon. Even in combat, Scotty gets the best lines. Excelsior shows up, Sulu secretly wondering, how did Ahura get my equipment? Helsman says, I number 14. Klingons got their scanners from the lowest bidder, probably a video game company from the 1980s. And it just showed they were over the Excelsior but fired from underneath, so minus one point. Minus one point here since they are not at red alert status in the back. Oh look, they're running through Enterprise D hallway again. Minus one point for a cloaked ship. It would take too much energy to hide it from scanners, bend light around it, and then hide all the energy used to hide it. Also, the Federation ships orbiting Kittimer would have come to help Enterprise when they saw the fighting, and the Klingon ships would have grouped together in case they had to go into combat, so minus one point. Minus one point for a doctor helping Spock and not an engineer, and minus one point for not already having this type of torpedo on the ship, since today they are called Patriot missiles. Oh look, they're losing gravity. Maybe all of them should have gravity boots. Is he talking about Chang or my commentary? This is torpedo number six. We never find out how many people died during the battle, but I don't think we'll be seeing the conference room for the next generation for the rest of season five. This looks a lot like the tunnel in a space odyssey. Kirk gets to be dramatic one last time. And as the torpedo searches for its target, this Klingon's last words are, I told you we should have converted to electric ships, but you didn't listen. And now look what happened. Look quick as this Klingon braces for impact. A Klingon ship will not rock like that while attacking zero gravity, so minus one point. Scotty changed back into his red uniform, so minus one point. While her is yelling, we're wondering who's flying the ship, minus one point. Kirk gets to leap onto the president and save the galaxy again. And how did Valeris get there, minus one point. Wait, wasn't this Klingon on Chang's ship? Sulu catches Admiral Cartwright. They're like, who is this guy? The reveal was deleted from the theatrical version. Kirk gets to make one last philosophical speech that brings peace to the world. This won't go to his head at all. Nonclus is thinking, just you all wait. The Romulans are coming back to Kittimer in 50 years. They're like, oh look, we all just beam down into the Star Trek invention. But why is there a Vulcan Idic on a Klingon wall? And they're thinking, we gotta get out of here before they want autographs. And Scotty changed back into his engineering uniform, so minus one more point. This is McCoy's last jab at Spock. Aww. Captain Sulu says, peace out y'all. Rand and I are going to be on Voyager and have our own TV series and comic book. Chekhov is thinking, thank god this is the last time I have to say a cheesy line in this movie. And minus one point for Excelsior not escorting Enterprise back. After all, it just got hit by six torpedoes. Uhura says, Captain, Starfleet called, and I'm in command of the Enterprise now since I'm the only one here that figured out how to find the Klingon ship. Spock utters a colorful metaphor. Kirk says, out there, that away. Chekhov does not say I number 15. And minus one point for a Stardate mismatch because three months have passed, not just one week. Kirk gives his last captain's log and decides to be a little more inclusive at the end. The last point is lost for misspelling Ahura's name. Usually I don't pick on the credits, but this is the last one after all. So who were the conspirators? 
Unfortunately, this video has already passed the 30 minute mark and there are so many I will have to go through them much faster than the credit they deserve. Michael Dorn, we will see him in the next 275 videos. Mark Leonard will return for two episodes of The Next Generation. Grace Lee Whitney will be back in Voyager. Burke and Samno are also stuntmen. Daryl Enriquez was also seen on Jumanji, The 13th Floor, and Deep Space Nine. David Orge has been on more than 300 commercials. Todd Bryant was Claw and The Interpreter. Amon was born in Somalia. She does a lot of modeling and has 25 screen credits. Christian Slater has 135 screen credits. Robert Easton was the Klingon judge with 165 screen credits including Lost in Space and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Paul Rossilli played Brigadier Curla. John Shuke played the Klingon ambassador twice and we'll see him again in Deep Space Nine and Enterprise. Kurt Woodsmith was the president and a dad in the 70s and now 90s. We will see him again on Voyager. David Warner just left us and has an incredible career with over 200 screen credits including Time After Time, Titanic, and we will see him again on The Next Generation. Rosanna DeSoto has 55 screen credits including Quantum Leap and Miami Vice. Kim Cattrall played Valeris and has 100 screen credits including Mannequin, Big Trouble in Little China, and of course Sex in the City. Brock Peters played Admiral Cartwright in Star Trek 4 and 6, has 130 screen credits, most importantly To Kill a Mockingbird, Roots, Starling Green, and Battlestar Galactica. Christopher Plummer was General Chang with more than 200 screen credits, born in Canada, a winner of the Emmy, Oscar, and Tony Awards. You will see him, of course, in The Sound of Music, Somewhere in Time, and National Treasure. Now, there are much more in-depth biographies of the stars. I encourage everyone to research them because, again, this video will not do them justice. In signature order, George Takei grew up in a Japanese internment camp during World War II, and along with Star Trek, has 250 screen credits, including the Green Berets, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and Twilight Zone. He is currently active in pushing gay rights. Nichelle Nichols, who recently left us, had the only role of the show endorsed by Martin Luther King Jr. Along with a singing and dancing career, 70 screen credits, she worked with NASA to encourage minorities to join the space race. Walter Koenig has 75 screen credits, including Babylon 5, Bring Him Back in Life, and as an admiral in many of the renegade fan-made Star Trek films. We'll see him again in Generation. James Doohan has also left us and has 100 screen credits, including Space Command in the 1950s and Jason of Star Command. He was on Juno Beach on D-Day, but unfortunately suffered from Alzheimer's at the end of his life. He makes two more next-gen appearances. DeForest Kelly has 130 screen credits and a massive amount of westerns in the golden age of TV, which earned him the Golden Boot Award. We'll see him again one more time in the next generation pilot. The first time he said, I'm a doctor, not a politician, was on the show The Millionaire in 1955. Leonard Nimoy has 130 screen credits, including Mission Impossible, Invasion of the Body and Snatchers, and will return as Spock in Next Generation and two of the Kelvin movies. He served in the U.S. Army in the early 50s, and he was fluent in Yiddish and Hebrew. William Shatner has 250 screen credits, also born in Canada. One of the first shows for him was Space Command with James Doohan. He was on The Twilight Zone, TJ Hooker, Boston Legal, and Kingdom of the Spiders. He recently flew to space on a SpaceX flight and is an expert equestrian and breeds horses as a hobby. And the USS Enterprise A was played by the original Enterprise because it never really blew up in the third movie. Yeah! Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country where the Klingons sue for peace since their energy facility exploded, when in reality all they needed was Mega Maid, gets a final score of... Six. <laughs> the Star Trek movies in order, a machine searches for God, Khan wants the Genesis device, everyone goes rogue, they save the whales, God wants a starship, and everyone quotes Shakespeare. What's ironic with this list is that the more popular movies get the lower score. I think if we like a movie better, we pick on it more, don't you think? And that ends the review of Star Trek The Original Series and Movies. Thanks for watching. Be sure to leave comments below and most importantly, click that like button, the share button, and that subscribe button. And stay tuned for the next generation where a godlike creature meets giant jellyfish. See you.